Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here. I hope you're all doing so 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 well. Welcome back to another true crime and makeup episode today. We are covering an absolute stinker of a case. I've been putting this off for a long time. I researched it, gathered all my notes and then I was like, I need a break. I need a break from this case. So I've covered other cases in the meantime but now I feel like emotionally prepared and ready. To do this for you. Today I am covering a highly requested case, that is a case of David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer. He is the epitome of evil monsters. What he subjected women to in this torture trailer that he built is unfathomable and unimaginable and I just need to put a warning out there, this is a very graphic episode. We will be delving into a lot of different things sexual torture, sexual abuse, murder. Please just be aware that this is a really heavy case and if it's something that you're going to struggle with, turn turn this episode off. It's not worth sacrificing your mental health. There will be a new video on Sunday that you can come back and watch and listen to me with but please, first things first, look after yourself. David Parker Ray was an absolute monster who lived in Elephant Butte and he developed a torture trailer that he called the Toy Box. This Toy Box had sexual torture devices, mostly ones that he had made himself, that were designed to inflict pain like you could never ever imagine. And some of these women, they would make it out alive, but they would have to live with these horrific memories forever. And some other women would have lost their lives completely. Now, before we do get into this case, please, please, please make sure you are subscribed with the notification bell on. If you're new here, hi, my name's Anna. I'm a certified yapper and one day decided I would like to come on the internet and yap about things that I find interesting. Hopefully find a community of people who also find it interesting. And I think I found you. It's a good time over here. No, no with the murder, but we have good chats in the comments. We really get to know each other and, you know, if you're a true crime fanatic, I'm here every Wednesday and Sunday with a long true crime case. If you are a regular here, you already know the drill. Leave a comment down below. Help push me out to that YouTube algorithm. It would mean the world to me. Any details of what's been used on my face will be linked down below. If you want to purchase anything or if you just want to have a wee browse at what I'm using on my face these days. But without any further rambling and any further ado, let's get into the case of David Parker Ray. Actually, before we hop in, can anyone tell me why this man looks like he's been smushed? His face looks smushed. Like, I can't describe it. It just looks like his face has been, like, in a compressor. Like, I don't know, like, is anyone else seen? Is this just me? Or do you see it too? David Parker Ray. The toy box killer. You probably know him better that way. Um, let me tell you, when I had finished my research for this, I want to say it was like last month, I finished the research and obviously I was having to listen to his tapes. Don't recommend listening to his tapes. And I was just like horrified. So I had to leave it alone for a hot minute, come back, cool cam collected and now I can cover it. So the sicko David Parker Ray, he was born on November the 6th of 1939 and he was born in Berlin of New Mexico. He was born to his parents Cecil Leland Ray and Nettie Opal Parker. Why are their names such a mouthful? I don't know why that was such a struggle but it really was. And Cecil, he was a native of Oregon whereas Nettie, she had been born in Texas. Now Cecil, Cecil, Cecile, whatever you want to call him, right? But he was an abusive man. He had a severe drinking problem and when he would drink, he was extremely abusive to his family and I don't just mean verbally abusive, like he would physically beat his family, especially David. Now this volatile household just became too much for Nettie and I mean I suppose Cecil as well even though he was the one throwing hands but they decided that they should get a divorce so they divorced officially when David was 10 years old and from this point onward Nettie never really took anything to do with her family and it is actually said that she had turned to alcohol and substance abuse and honestly this kind of took over her life as it does for many who suffer from the disease that is addiction. 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 I don't know why I said it like addiction. 
I need to remember that I'm Scottish and I really need to like enunciate my words, especially because I've, I had to laugh. So on my Salem witch trials video, so many people thought I was saying wet cheese instead of witches. And I hear it, I hear it. It sounds like wet cheese, but that's how I say witches. Maybe if I said it more like witches. No, that sounds like witches. I, d I don't know. So during David's childhood, him and his sister, Peggy Perel Ray, PPR, they would go to live with Nettie's parents, Dolly and Russell. Now, Dolly and Russell, they were very, very strict disciplinarians. So, you know, out of one bad environment into another. Now, Dolly and Russell, they lived on a very, very, very small ranch and they were in a very poor financial position. And to be completely honest, they weren't really in any position to take on these children but someone had to and they were the children's grandparents at the end of the day so they would rather see the children be with them than with a stranger. However, whilst they're doing this nice thing of taking in these children, Dolly and Russell, they were just so mean to Peggy and David. Like it was not a nice environment at all. It was apparently very hostile, very turbulent. Peggy and David couldn't do anything right. They would be berated for any tiny mistake that they made. So Cecil, Cecil, Cecil. He would actually visit David on quite a sporadic basis. Is that even a basis? If not, it was very few and far between. And he would come over and visit, which sounds like, oh great, you know, Cecil wants to stay involved with his son. That's nice to hear. Um, It wasn't great. And honestly, David probably could have went without these visits. So when Cecil would come to visit, he used to bring things with him, which, you know, sounds great. Like, oh, is it toys? Is it a bike? Is it some chocolates? No, it was porn. And not just any porn. It was like savage, like BDSM bondage porn. Bearing in mind, David is a literal child. Shouldn't know what any of that is. But Cecil's coming round with porn. And not only would he come round with porn, he'd also beat David. So like David would take a beat in and then flick through the porn mags with his dad. And like this porn that he would show his son, it depicted sadomasochism. It was like women being tied up and restrained, which like is fine if you consent to that. But showing a young boy who's not even in high school yet porn like this, he's going to grow up thinking that that's what the norm is. Like you just tie women up, hog tie them and do your thing. So anytime Cecil comes over, David winds up with a new little nudie mag to add to his collection, you know, collector's items and all. So David, he would go on to attend Mountaineer High School in Mountaineer, New Mexico. And whilst he was in high school, he was an easy target for bullies. Like he was mocked, verbally abused, physically abused, and usually he was being bullied because of his shyness. Like he was quite quiet, quite reserved, kept to himself. And in particular, they thought his shyness around girls was hilarious. Now, because of this bullying and harassment that he was facing at school and also the bullying from his dad and his grandpa and, you know, probably Dolly, he would turn to heavy drinking and also heavy drug use. And at some points, David was actually turning up to high school, like 14 years old, turning up drunk. Also, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing with this makeup today. Like, I don't have a plan. I don't even have a pla, you know? I'm just, no idea. I think I want to do some kind of red wing. I guess I have a pla. I just don't have a plan. Now, it would actually be throughout David's teenage years when he started imagining and fantasizing about torturing, raping, brutalizing women and then murdering them. Like this started so, so, so young. He would even do like drawings of women being tied up, hogtied, penetrated, tortured in agony. I cannot tell you enough. These illustrations, these drawings are so bloody graphic. Like if I can insert them in this video, then I absolutely will. But I don't even think YouTube will allow it because they're just shocking. But when he was 14 years old, his sister actually found his sadomasochistic and bondage s and drawings that he had done. And this terrified her so much because 
there was like pain in these women's faces. Like I know he's a 14 year old drawing, like how much pain could it show? But she was just so disturbed by what she found when she found these drawings. She actually started to distance herself from David from that very day. Going forward, she completely distanced herself from him. And like, that's when you know it's bad because it takes a lot to distance yourself from a family member. But she just knew that something wasn't right with David. Now, it was said within high school, like when David wasn't steaming drunk or on drugs, like he was pretty smart. You know, he was quite an intellect. And it's this intellect that he had that would make him very good at manipulating people and playing mind games with them. And we will see this later. But David, surprisingly, he winds up finishing high school. Came as a shock to me too. And David, he would serve in the US Army for a period of time before being honourably discharged. Now, whilst he was in the army, he was working as a mechanic. And even when he left the army, this is what he continued to do because... It was like an area that he thrived in, to be honest. And it's very unfortunate that he would thrive in this area because this will come into play, but he would do this from his teenage years all the way up through his life till, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. Now, what's crazy is like co-workers, customers, friends of David's, they all said that he was absolutely wonderful at his job. He was smart. He was funny. He had charm. He had like the gift of the gab. He could just yap away like us. But we're good people or you better be. Otherwise, I will phone the police. And people thought like he was so generous in the way that he would teach people how to fix things themselves, how to repair things, how to build things for themselves so they didn't have to pay money for someone else to do it. I wish a mechanic around here would do that. I'm sick and tired of paying for my car. Now, David, right? David, pff, Arts and Craft Central, he was, he was good. I'm not going to lie, okay? He, he was good at what he did. He would make his own tools because it was said that David felt his tools that he had bought, like store-bought tools, um, bottom of the pile he could make ones that were so much better so he would be like really innovative inventive innovative one of those he was one of those and he would create his own tools from scratch and apparently they worked pretty amazingly and not only could David build things and create things he was just known to be very good with his hands his scraggly ugly crispy looking hands David, when he got back from the army, he would work as a maintenance man and also a mechanic for the New Mexico Parks Department. And this parks department was in a place called Truth or Consequences, which is very, very fitting. So Truth and Consequences, this was like a little small resort town that was around five miles away from Elephant Butte, New Mexico. Now this place had a lot of local bars, like little clubs that you could attend. There was one called Blue Water Saloon and this was very popular and it would be often frequented by sex workers, drug addicts, alcoholics, like people who who were struggling and David, he would frequent this place a lot and this is actually where he would pick up a lot of his victims. There was a lot that astonished me in this case and this was one of them. David, somehow, he managed to get married and divorced four times. There must be something in the water in truth or consequences because I do not see how that man is landing a woman. He looks like a cartoon. I can't I can't describe why, but he looks like he's been smooshed, like squished up. He just looks squished, like facially. I, I don't know. He looks a bit smooshed. Like, I'm not sure about the women seeing him, okay? But I'm telling you this for a reason. And that is because David had told his very first wife that he had committed murder in 1957, where he had tied a woman to a tree, raped her, tortured her, and then murdered her. And like, for some reason, his wife just thought like he was talking out his ass. Like he's a bit of a weirdo, our David, but like, he's all right. And she had believed that he was suffering from some kind of mental illness. Cause like, surely, surely not he, surely he's not to that. No. Now throughout their marriage, David's behavior would get even worse. Like she was getting extremely worried about the kind of man that she had married and he started to show a lot of sexual deviancy and 
had all these rape fantasies that he wanted to play out with her and ultimately that led her to end the marriage. So he exhibited worrying behaviour but it wasn't worrying enough that you should take the information you had to the police about the murder. Listen, we can't judge her. We can't. Now, not a jump ahead, but police believe that this claim could be true because later on they would actually find a tape that David used on all of his victims and in this tape he stated, I've been raping bitches since I was old enough to jerk off and tie little girls' hands behind their backs. That is only scratching the surface. I've listened to this tape and I wanted to run to my therapist. Now, from these marriages, David would have two children. So one, I wasn't able to find any information on for some reason, but couldn't find any information on her. And then the other daughter, we know because she's kind of important to the case because, you know, apple tree, not far apart. And this daughter was Glenda Jean Ray, who was better known as Jessie, but like, I'm not her pal, so I'm just going to call her Glenda. I'm not nicknaming her. Now, David said that he really enjoyed life in Elephant Butte. Like, he, he loved it. It was quiet. A lot of people pass through. People come and go. It's mostly full of elderly or retired individuals who just want a bit of peace and quiet and a bit of good weather. Now, this was perfect for David, right? Because it's like a desert surrounding him. And none of his neighbours were really nosy. And there was plenty of space between the neighbours and the town. And he didn't want anyone knowing or hearing what it is that he will be getting up to. And also because so many people came and went, it was very easy for David to make one of these people disappear and no one notice because usually people were just passing through. Listen, do those wings match? No. But am I a woman who likes to push her luck? A wee bit, but not in this case. So anyway, there was this man-made lake in between Elephant Butte and Truth or Consequences. Now at this lake, a lot of homeless people would set up camp there. Like it was a nice little resort area. You know, you're not kind of bothering anyone because it's near the lake. And this lake was known to be homed, lived on by homeless individuals, drug addicts, alcoholics, sex workers, just people who were struggling in general. Now, the other thing to know about like Truth or Consequences Elephant Butte is it had a very, very, very high crime rate and a lot of these crimes were murders. Like a lot of sex workers, drug addicts and alcoholics, they were all being murdered. But as usual, when it comes to the police, they don't care about helping anyone who's in a tough position. Like those people I've just mentioned, they look down on them for some reason and don't treat them like an actual human being. So a lot of these murders would go uninvestigated. They would go cold right away. And that makes me sick. So after four divorces, let's call this guy Ross Geller, let's be real. But after four divorces, David wasn't ready to give up in love. He was going to give it one last shot. And luckily for him, he would meet 37-year-old Cindy Hendy. Cindy Hendy, she was working at the state park and she was fleeing convictions for grand theft and also drug charges in Washington state. So, you know, sounds like a great woman. So I just thought with her being so heavily involved in the case, we're just going to dive into a bit of background on Cindy Hendy and when I say a bit of background, like it's pretty minuscule, but it's just details I felt were important to the case. So when Cindy was a young child, she witnessed her mum being brutally beaten by her boyfriend at the time named Dick. I've not heard a better fitting name than a man who abuses his girlfriend and being called Dick. Now, eventually Cindy's mother had left this Dick and she left this guy and then went with another guy when Cindy was eight years old. Now, Cindy had claimed that when she was 11, this very man crawled into her bed in the middle of the night, 11 years old, remember, and attempted to rape her. This guy had actually told Cindy's mother that he thought he was in Cindy's mother's bed and he was trying to get on with Cindy's mother. He didn't realise he had crawled into bed with Cindy. And guess who Cindy's mother believes? The boyfriend, of course. Now Cindy's mother at this point not believing Cindy, she thinks, what do you do with an 11 year old child who 
claims these things, but it was actually an accident. Um, well, when they turned 12 years old, you just kick them out of the house. That's what Cindy Hendy's mother did. She chucked Cindy out of the house when she was 12 years old and left her to try and fend for herself. Obviously, at this age, Cindy has no way of supporting herself and she gets involved with drug dealers. She starts prostituting herself out and she also became heavily dependent on alcohol and cocaine at the age of 12. Now, Cindy herself, she admitted that she loved near violent, aggressive sex. And this near violent sex that she spoke about was also rape fantasies. Like she used to fantasize about being raped and she would want to role play this with many of her partners. She wanted to act out this rape fantasy when her partner was the rapist and she was the person being raped. And like, I just want to say like, Cindy said that this is what she enjoyed, but I look at it from the aspect of her childhood. If she went through what she said she did, that could be a trauma response where it's almost like her taking back the control. So one day, Cindy says to one of her partners, you know, I would really like to rape someone, maybe a prostitute. And the partner's kind of like, oh, that's, that's a strange request. Um, never heard that one in the bedroom. I don't know if they actually did this, but honestly, with the monster Cindy becomes, it would not surprise me. Now, at some point, Cindy does give birth to three children, to three different men, and kind of like her mother, she decides that she doesn't want to look after these children anymore, so she ships off the children to go and live with her grandparents so she can continue living the life she's living. So now we're coming back full circle to when these two sick, twisted lovebirds finally meet. They bonded right away. They had an immediate connection and the more they dated, the more they revealed, you know, sacred parts of each other to one another. And then like one day they're sitting down and they're like, hmm, what do we have in common? Like, what's our commonalities? And I'm thinking maybe the same colour. Maybe they both like sushi or, you know, maybe they both like Little Richard. I don't know. But these two, they shared the same sick, depraved, sex fantasies as the other and this strengthened their bond. They also seem to have the same thirst for sadomasochistic sex. So like match made in hell. I have no idea what I'm doing right now but I'm just trying something. I don't know what I've done and I just know for a fact I'm never going to be able to do it on this eye so I'm just going to do it like separately in a minute but just carrying on with the case just now. So like I said, the pair, they date for a while, okay? They're falling in love, they have common interests, which, <laughs> so cute. And they would move into a double wide mobile home together. But with this mobile home, they had a lot of land and a lot of desert around them. There wasn't really any neighbours who were like too close by, but like th th there was neighbours, like you could see other neighbours' houses. But any neighbours who were further up the street, they all really kept to themselves. Everyone just did their own thing, you know, but privacy, they weren't very nosy neighbours. So this was ideal for Cindy and David. Now, one thing we need to know about David Parker Ray, the man had dreams, big dreams, right? And the lucky man that he is, he had Cindy Hendy here, who was willing to stand by his side no matter what he wanted, anything to please her man. So one day, Cindy's chilling, right? David strolls into the living room and he's like, Cindy baby, I really, really, really want to build a big torture trailer out the back of our mobile home where we can subject women to the most inhumane and horrific torture that you could ever, ever, ever imagine. Let's brutalise women together. It'll be sweet. And Cindy, instead of like running for the hills and calling the police, she turns around and she's like, I'm sure, baby, whatever makes you happy. So then David and Cindy, well, if I'm honest, it's not really Cindy because like Cindy doesn't really have much in the way of cash. David, um, they purchase this empty, big, soundproof trailer. And not only do they purchase that, they spend around £100,000 for supplies that they're going to keep inside this. Not just any supplies. Supplies that they could use to torture women in the most brutal, horrifying and scarring way you could ever, ever imagine. Now remember how I was saying, David 
really good with his hands, very handy. He's like the handyman and um, really good at making stuff, repairing stuff. This is where that skill is really going to come into play in the worst way possible. And I just need to warn you, the things that I'm going to talk about now are so bloody disturbing. It's just going through the objects that was in his trailer, but it's so disturbing. So this torture trailer that they had bought, it was 15 by 25 feet wide. Like really, I mean, quite sizey for a trailer. And this trailer was dedicated to nothing other than complete depravity and bondage, torture. If you can think of what you would believe to be the most horrendous sexual torture that you could ever imagine, times it by a hundred. Now, David, he had also used like bondage porn magazine pages to like wallpaper the trailer. So it was wallpapered with bondage porn. And he also used some of his own little sex drawings um, to wallpaper his environment as well. Now, these drawings, they would also depict the sort of torture that these women would be facing when they're with him. There was also like a lot of things leading to Satan. Like David did say that he was like part of Satan's church or like the leader or whatever. And he had this sign that said like Satan's den. And I have to ask, is hell empty? Because I swear on this earth, there are so many demons and devil people. I can't imagine that hell's very full. Now, also in this torture chamber, there was medical manuals. There was manuals that were dedicated purely to the female anatomy. There was also a ton of like whips, chains, really, really inhumane sexual toys. And like, let me tell you, these sex toys, dildos, huge humongous. Like looking at it, my eyes nipped and my legs crossed. Like it really, really bad. Like this, honestly, like this wide and they were long and these things had nails that were like pointing up. So when they were being inserted, which by the way, I, I don't know how these things could possibly be inserted because they're huge. But when they're inserted, the nails would cut and tear the flesh. There was also nails underneath this like pointed out the way so it would like tear up the flesh on their thighs and stuff and on. it just makes me feel so sick that anybody would have to endure that. And like honestly even if these things didn't have the nails the pain and torture that would inflict is just unimaginable. Now David, he had also built a sex machine that had like this huge sex toy attached to it and obviously it was designed to go back and forth. Don't know why I'm doing this. But it was designed to go back and forth, but in a way that would inflict the most horrific pain as well as internal damage. Listen, I don't know how he got this right, but this sick freak, he was able to get himself a gynecologist chair, like the one with the stirrups and stuff like that. Like, are people just selling these on eBay? I'm not sure. Why does he have it? Now, this chair, the stirrups, they were set up in a way that it would spread the woman's legs abnormally wide and the pain that these women must have been in because the way that they were designed to spread the legs meant that because their legs had been spread so wide their hips would pop out of place and their muscles would tear. How someone is capable of so much evil is just beyond me. And with this position that they were in, they were strapped in so tightly that there was no way that these women could adjust themselves to relieve any pain. And on this chair is where that they would be raped and assaulted and tortured by Cindy, David and their other accomplices. Now, he also had this like table thing that he could strap women down on and above this table was a mirror. So these women would have to watch what they were enduring. And if these women shut their eyes, David would force them open or they would inflict even more pain to these women and tell them that they'll stop inflicting that pain as long as they keep their eyes open and their eyes on that mirror on the ceiling so they can see what David and Cindy and whoever else was doing to them. Now, David had built this like metal restraint frame and he said that he would bring this into the living room with his captive at parties with other sick freaks. Now this is all in his tape by the way, he actually, you can hear him speak about this in his tapes and it's just 
so disturbing. These women, they would be restrained in this frame with their arms, their legs, their ankles, their knees, their waist, their hips. They would just be completely restrained, completely unable to move. And the way it would have them bent over is like on all fours. And he said that he would have them in this doggy position because he was going to bring in his dogs. And in particular, his large German Shepherd. And I'm honestly starting to feel sick as I talk about this because it's absolutely vile and just unbelievably evil. Like, Again, we talk about evil all the time, but this man... Oh, so David said that this restraint frame, it would hold the, the woman's legs open for 12 inches. So 12 inches apart. David would then gather his buddies on the sofa. They would all sit and watch as David poured dog food, like gravy, and also it refers to dog musk in his tapes. I've never heard of that, so maybe I'm just daft, but I've literally never heard of it. So David would put the musk and the dog food on the women's necks, their ears, their face, their anus, their vagina, and then he would let the dogs into the living room to rape these women. Like, he, he loved bestiality. And he says it himself in his tapes. He loves bestiality. And he loves it so much that sometimes he would even join in with his dogs. But he loved having his buddies around on the sofa, watching this woman be humiliated and watch them be raped by a dog. And honestly, it's like when I'm saying this, I'm like, oh my God. It's, that, it's like when you say it out loud and you're like, these women actually endured this. Like... Now, also within this torture toy box, there was a load of medical instruments. There was syringes. There was also saws, screwdrivers, like just tools in general. There was a load of Polaroids of women he had previously captured being tortured and raped. And he also had these up on display. And he even had like sex dolls all like strung up from the ceiling and they were depicted in this horrific manner as well. Now there was also a fur-lined coffin that he had where he would keep the women sometimes to imprison them. So now that we have went through the horrific items within this toy box, this torture trailer, we are going to talk about one of David Parker Ray's victims who was able to escape and survive this horrifying ordeal that she went through. And her name is Cynthia Vigil Jeremilo. So on March the 19th of 1999, 22-year-old Cynthia, she was in an Albuquerque, New Mexico parking lot and this is where a man would come over to her and ask if she wants to go back to his trailer to have sex. Now Cynthia, she was a sex worker at this point and she agrees to go back to his trailer. Now this man, he unveils that he is in fact an undercover policeman and that she has been arrested for solicitation of prostitution. So this policeman handcuffs Cynthia, puts her in the back of his car and starts to drive off. Now while Cynthia's in the back of this car being driven to God knows where, she just has this nagging feeling that something's not quite right here. She couldn't tell what it was but she could just sense that something was wrong. She felt in danger and honestly her instincts were absolutely correct because of course she had not been picked up by a policeman. She had been picked up by David Parker Ray. Now desperate David, he proceeds to drive Cynthia two hours south to his toy box, torture box, whatever you want to call it, in Elephant Butte. Now, once Cynthia was there, David Parker Ray took her into the trailer. He then put a dog collar around her neck, one of these dog collars that has like spikes. And this dog collar was attached to a chain and then this chain was attached to the floor. So like, there is literally no way of getting out of this unless you've got the key for the padlocks. David then proceeded to chain Cynthia to this medical looking table that we discussed earlier. He then proceeded to play his tape for her. Now listen, this guy, certified japper, like not in a good way, not like us, certified japper. This tape, 50 minutes long. He said this was his torture tape and then like if you switched over on the back, it was like his hypnosis tape that he would 
used to hypnotise women before letting them go, if he let them go. In this tape, he details to these women exactly what's going to happen to them. He's referring to them as bitch, being vulgar, being vile. He tells them that dogs will be having sex with them. He then says that any hole in their body will be used for his pleasure. He's going to rape them anally, vaginally. She will also have to perform oral sex on David and Cindy, who he referred to as his mistress. Oh, and also he called himself Dungeon Master. Get a grip. It's not Dungeons and Dragons. And it would be in this trailer for three days that Cynthia would be brutalised, tortured, raped on countless times by Cindy and David. Now, Cynthia knew right away from stepping into this trailer, she knew that this wasn't David's first time and it wasn't Cindy's first time either, but specifically David. She said the way he talked, it was far too well planned. And she actually said the following, the way he talked, I didn't feel like this was his first time. It was like he knew exactly what he was doing. He told me I was never going to see my family again. He told me he would kill me like the others. So quite clearly he has killed before. And Cynthia's just lying here thinking that she's going to be his next victim. She's going to be the next girl who mysteriously disappears and no one knows what happened to her. Now, at one point, Cynthia overheard a conversation between David and Cindy, and they were talking about what they were gonna do to a young girl. And I mean a very young girl, we're talking teenager, if that. And this made Cynthia completely distraught because she could not imagine another woman, let alone a young girl, enduring exactly what she has endured and it was from this moment that Cynthia thought I'm not going to be another number that he gets to say he killed. I am going to get out of here and I am going to get justice for the women who have been subjected to this torture, abuse and possibly murder and I am also going to prevent this from happening to anyone in the future. So at this point, it's now been three days where Cynthia has been subjected to the worst torture and rape ever and David would go off to work on this day and David leaves Cynthia with Cindy who he believes has a very watchful eye but does not have a watchful eye at all. Cindy didn't really think things through, she didn't really plan things the way that David did and to be honest Cindy was nothing without David. So at this point Cynthia is like chained onto a bed in the living room and you know Cindy's meant to be watching over her but Cindy gets a phone call and like, how is she going to pass up the opportunity to catch up with old friends? So Cindy, she starts to wander out the room to take this phone call, like, what's up, bitch? And Cindy, the big thickle that she is, she leaves the keys to the restraints on the table. Now, Cynthia, immediately she sees this and she is thinking like, this is my moment. I either take it now or I might be a victim here. So Cynthia, she's like, Jesus, take the wheel. And she starts shuffling her way forward, like using her feet to scooch the bed along to the table. And she's able to get the keys. Now, of course, Cynthia's trying to work these keys and get her restraints off. And there's quite a few locks that she has to go through. So the keys, as she's moving them, they're obviously jingling. And Cindy, she hears this. So Cindy's like, right, call you back in 10. She quickly runs through the living room. And this is where she sees Cynthia unlocking the restraints. So Cindy immediately is like, I need to take action here, otherwise I could possibly go to jail. So she runs over, she jumps on top of Cynthia and then she grabs a lamp and like smashes it over Cynthia's head, which like kind of knocks her funny because she's just been hit with a lamp. But luckily Cynthia is still fighting. She is getting Cindy off of her and she is able to free herself from the restraints. Now, once she's free, she sort of looks around the room and she sees an ice pick sitting. She picks up this ice pick and she stabs Cindy with it. So Cynthia, after she stabs Cindy, she bolts to the front door, runs out of that house and just takes off. Like she's, she's naked and she's still got this dog collar on, but all she is thinking about at this point is her escape and her survival. Now, there is neighbours' houses close by to David Parker Ray's house, but in this tape that he made, he said that the neighbours were all in on it, so she obviously wants to avoid these houses, whether they were or not. 
who knows, but apparently. So she starts sprinting down a main road. She is screaming, begging for help. She's trying to shout about what happened to her. She's trying to flag down vehicles, but ultimately no one wants to stop for her. She goes around all these different houses and then finally she comes to a house of a woman who opens the door to her. This woman then takes Cynthia inside, locks the door, phones the police to get her help. So the police, they arrive and they take Cynthia into the hospital to be treated for her injuries and obviously to be questioned. They want to know who did this, what exactly did they do and where can we find this person? Cynthia then, very bravely might I add, she tells the police exactly what happened to her, exactly what she had been subjected to, the abuse, the torture. She even describes the man who did it. She describes where she had ran from, where the trailer was. She explains that this man had captured her with his girlfriend and that she was partaking in this abuse and torture as well. But what Cynthia doesn't realise at this point in time is the police, they're not taking her seriously. Not one bit. They think she's a sex worker drug addict who's been strung up for days and thinks this is all just one big lie. Which makes my blood boil. Like, someone is not less of a human because they're a sex worker. Someone is not less of a human because they struggle with addiction, which, by the way, is a disease. And it's a disease that people should not be shamed for struggling with because it is one of the most horrific diseases that can take anyone. Anyone can be taken by addiction. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're bottom of the barrel. It means that you're someone who's been through stuff and this disease, addiction, has got a hold of you. It is nothing to be ashamed about and if anyone out there struggles with addiction, please know it is nothing to be ashamed about and there is help available and you can get better and you deserve to get better. And it's like, how do police put these numbers together thinking, well, she's a sex worker and an addict, so she must be a liar. Is there a rule book in place? Absolute idiots. So Cynthia, she is in the hospital having to deal with these absolute idiot police officers who refuse to take her seriously. And then luck strikes for Cynthia. Because who walks into that very room to be treated for nothing other than a stab wound? That's right, people. Cindy, Cindy, the stupid actually went to hospital to get some help. Is she forgetting that if a girl went free, she's probably going to make her way to the hospital to be treated? Now, as soon as Cynthia seen Cindy, she starts shouting and screaming to the police. She's like, that's her, oh my God, that's her, that's the girlfriend, like, that's the one who did this to me. So police, they decide that they're going to question Cindy and, you know, see if the stories line up. When they're talking to her, they decide, you know what, maybe if we go back to this trailer home, we will be able to decipher the story and sort of put together what's fact and what's not. So they arrive at Cindy and David's home and the first thing they think is, what a complete dump. Who the hell lives in this mess? Now they also seen the bed in the living room with the chains attached. They seen a bucket that Cynthia had said to them was in the living room that she was forced to do the toilet in. And this bucket did contain human waste. So again, backing up her story. Now they had also found the broken lamp that Cynthia had said Cindy used to smash over her head. And there was also just very evident signs of a struggle. Now, police feel as though this scene lines up exactly with what Cynthia had explained to them. So they go ahead and they arrest Cindy and David. Now, initially, when they both are questioned, they try to say that Cynthia was a heroin addict. And yeah, they did have her chained up to a bed, but they were trying to help her detox because like they're good citizens. You know, they're doing their bit. However, police, they would search the trailer, the toy box, and any questions that they had would be answered from there. In this trailer, police would find exactly what Cynthia told them they would find. So they find an audio tape, which is David Parker Ray's weird torture tape and then his hypnosis tape. They found torture instruments. They found victims clothing, jewellery. There was Polaroids of girls being tortured, raped and abused. There was cattle prods that were used on the females. There was also stun guns. There was a very, very detailed journal of David's that detailed what he had done to his victims. Just everything, everything that we had went through and more was found in this trailer. As I said, there was loads of satanic signs within his torture trailer, whatever we're going to call it now. 
all these satanic signs that were hung up and then there was also a clipboard and this clipboard had like a ton of dates on it now it didn't have victims names but it was believed that these dates correlated with the dates that women had been abducted next to the dates these notch like tally marks and this was to count how many times he had assaulted his victims or at least that's what police believe it wasn't confirmed by david but that's what they took from it and the dates would line up. Now next to this there was like a detailed list of things for David to remember and also Cindy and whoever else he had in this trailer but it was like things that they had to remember throughout the attacks, throughout the tortures, like to not give in to the women. So this warning list said, remember a woman will do or say anything to get loose. They will kick, scratch, offer money, bite, yell, beg, scream, run, offer sex, threaten, lie, wait for opportunity and they will have these standard excuses and sob stories. Menstruating, pregnant, VD, AIDS, sick, kids with babysitter, have to work, a sick baby, a sick parent, claustrophobia, missed by husband or friend, bad heart, can't miss school, don't let her get to you. If she is worth taking, she's worth keeping and she must be subjected to hypnosis before the woman can be safely released. Never trust a chained captive. What? But devastatingly, police and investigators, they would have to review and watch some of this footage from the trailer that David had taken of these young women being tortured in all the ways that we've discussed. And there was one videotape in particular where they noticed a female who was in no fit state to consent. She was in and out of consciousness. And in this tape, you can see David walk over to play his torture tape. And honestly, I was thinking like, bro thinks he's Jigsaw, like from the Saw movies, like bro thinks he's Jigsaw. Why are you playing a tape? Just talk. But anyway, so the police, they are examining this footage and they're trying to work out how best can they find out who this woman is? Does she have any identifiers? Like, how are they going to work this out? And that's when they notice a very large tattoo and it's a very unique tattoo as well. It's not like a typical tattoo that just anyone would have. It's like a unique one that could possibly have meaning behind it. So police, they're able to get a very clear like photograph of this and they put it out to the media. They ask, does anyone have this tattoo or know anyone that has this tattoo? And if they do have this tattoo or know someone who does, come forward to the police and let them know. This is when a woman by the name of Kelly Garrett would come forward to the police and say, that, that's my tattoo, like what's wrong? Now, she had been made aware of the tattoo in the media after her ex-mother-in-law had told her about it and said, Kelly, you know, this, this is your tattoo, like you better contact the police. So in July of 1996, Kelly was living with her husband in Elephant Butte. Now this one day they get into a very heavy, heated argument and it's one of those arguments that after it, you just need to get away. You need to get away, blow off steam. At this point, Kelly's thinking, I don't want to sit in here and look at my husband's angry face all night. I'm going to go out with the girls, go for a couple of drinks, let loose and enjoy myself. So she heads to a bar, the Blue Water Saloon, David Parker Ray, he frequented this. And while she was there with the girls, she's having a good time, she's playing pool, she's drinking beer. And then she bumps into an old friend. Who's this old friend I hear you ask? It's Glenda Jean Ray, David Parker Ray's daughter. Now, Kelly, at this point, she's happy to catch up with an old friend. So she's standing, she's speaking to Glenda. And then when Kelly's friends are heading home, she's like, you know what? I'm I'm going to stay behind with Glenda. Like, I'm still enjoying myself. I'm going to have a couple of drinks with Glenda and, you know, I'll go home later. What Kelly would not know at this point is this old friend had plans and an ulterior motive to serve Kelly Garrett up on a silver platter to her sadistic evil father. So whilst Kelly believes that her and Glenda are having a good time together, Glenda spikes Kelly's beer. Now she's starting to feel a bit dizzy, a bit uneasy, and she wants to leave and go home. Understandably so. And Glenda says, well, you know, if you come out with me, like I'll give you a lift, get you home safe. And Kelly's very grateful for this. So she heads out into the parking lot and Glenda Jean Ray comes up behind her, hits her over the head and knocks her out. 
She then gets Kelly into the car, takes her back to her father's trailer, where Kelly was then put into the chained dog collar and drugged. Kelly would be in and out of consciousness whilst the most horrific things happened to her. And two days later, she would wake up on the side of the road. Her throat had been slit and she could not remember what had happened to her. But she remembered one thing for sure, and that is that she had been raped. Of course, Kelly's at the side of the road. She's got a slit throat. She looks badly beaten. This man pulls over and he offers to give Kelly a ride to the local clinic, you know, just to get her injuries checked, get stitches if she needs them. So Kelly accepts this lift. She goes to the clinic and then soon after she is free to go home. So she returns home to her husband, who bearing in mind has not seen her or heard from her in two days. Kelly then proceeds to tell her husband that she does not know exactly what has happened to her over the course of these two days. What she does know is that she has been raped and she is worried that more things had happened to her that she just can't remember. And honestly, what's just so upsetting is Kelly's husband, he didn't believe her at all. When she had mentioned being raped, he assumed that she had actually been cheating on him and she was trying to use this as an excuse. He believes that she went on a drink and drug bender and wound up cheating on him with some other guy that she met at the bar. And what's crazy is just over the course of a week, Kelly's husband would leave her and file for divorce. After this ordeal, Kelly, she's having nightmares about what's happened to her. She's seeing herself be restrained, tortured, raped constantly. These devices being used on her. But she assumed that it, all of this was from the stress of the rape. Like surely these other things hadn't actually happened. Now, when Kelly goes to the police about her tattoo, the police asked her, you know, what specifically did you endure? Kelly tells him that she has no idea what she endured. I mean, she thinks that she was raped, but no one had took her seriously. And when they were going into detail about these different things that might have happened to her, Kelly was so confused because she didn't remember any of that happening to her and she was honestly in denial. And the police had no other choice but to show her the tape and the abuse that she had truly been subjected to. And how you ever come back from that, I will never, ever know. But when Kelly had to watch this tape of herself, suddenly it's like it triggered all these memories and they all came flooding back to her and suddenly she was just distraught as she remembered everything that she went through. Now the media, they got a hold of this story really quick. I mean, of course they did. But in a way, it was, it was quite good to get these victims' stories out. It helped bring forward more victims. So another young woman who had come forward was Angelica Montano. Now, she was an acquaintance of David's. She thought he was a nice guy, he was friendly, he was helpful, until he wasn't. Now, one day, Angelica, she had went over to David's trailer. She wanted to borrow some cake mix. And before she knew it, she was drugged, tortured, raped, and then dumped at the side of a highway. Now, when police found her, Angelica told them exactly what had happened to her. She remembered what happened to her. She told them who did it, where it was, where his trailer was. But yet again, Angelica was a sex worker and a struggling drug addict and they chose not to believe her. Once this had been through the media, that's when Angelica decided, like, I'm going to come forward, and she made police aware that she had reported this once before, and they decided to not take her seriously. And they don't even apologise. They just decide that now they're going to take her seriously. Now, police are thinking, they're like, we've got witnesses, we've got victims, we definitely have a strong case against David, and now we could put a bit more pressure on Cindy to get some further information. Now, when they question Cindy, the, the lover, the loyal lover, she folds like a cheap suit. She's ready to give out names, addresses, phones, anything you need, she's going to give you it now. So Cindy, she decides that she is going to tell the police what she knows or, you know, at least some of what she knows because I'm sure she doesn't want to incriminate herself too heavily. She would say that David Parker Ray had multiple accomplices. There was people from the neighbourhood. She claimed that there was people in the police. Yep, police corruption. <laughs> Never heard of that before. And specifically, she gave up Glenda Jean Ray's name and also her dad's friend, Dennis Roy Yancey. She also confirmed that the victim total was upward of 40 
and that some of these victims had actually been murdered. Cindy explained to police that when David Parker Ray had murdered someone, he would scoop out all of their insides and then fill them with cement blocks and throw them in the lake. Then she even says that Glenda Jean Ray and also this Dennis Yancey guy, they had murdered Dennis's ex-girlfriend, 22-year-old Marie Parker. Now, despite this testimony from Cindy, David's girlfriend, David's accomplice, police didn't have enough to charge him for murder. So there would be three separate trials for the three victims who came forward. So that would be Angelica, Cynthia and Kelly. Now, somehow Cynthia's first trial led to a mistrial and then a retrial and ultimately a conviction. And this conviction was for all 12 counts of which David Parker Ray was accused. Now, devastatingly, Angelica Montano, she would not get her day in court. She would not get the justice that she deserved. She had actually passed away from a drug overdose before her trial date. And I can only imagine that her addiction must have been so much worse after she was subjected to this horrific torture, abuse and rape. But it just breaks my heart that she never, it just breaks my heart that she never got the justice that she deserved. And then ultimately her life was taken from her before she even had the chance to recover or try to live a happy life. It's just no fair. In the trial for Kelly Garrett, David Parker Ray, he entered a plea and this plea basically meant that he would serve 224 years in prison but his daughter Glenda Jean Ray would get a lesser sentence. And I could not be prepared for how much of a lesser sentence it would be for this evil monster. Cindy Hendy, she was tried as an accomplice and she was sentenced to only 36 years in prison, which is like a slap on the wrist to me for what she did. She is a sadistic evil monster as well. And honestly, every single one of them should have got the death penalty or favourably put in prison and let the other inmates do whatever they want to them. Let them endure the torture that they put, do you know, put them in the trailer put them in the toy box and do to them what they did to others. Now, this is going to infuriate you guys the way it infuriated me, but this woman, after 18 years, she was eligible for parole. And in 2019, that evil <laughs> got out of prison. She's living life. She's just doing her own thing now. She, she roams free. And I had seen someone online say that she's actually moved to a place where she's directly across from a school a school of young children, young females like the ones that she would help torture. Glenda Jean Ray, she would only receive two and a half years in prison and she was only taken on charges of kidnapping. Now there was also an additional five years to be served on probation but like yet again, slap on the wrist. Actually, that's not a slap on the wrist, that is a little tap on the wrist. Dennis Yancey, he would be convicted of the murder of his girlfriend, 22-year-old Marie Parker. Now, he received two 15-year sentences and he was released in 2011 after only serving 11 years. But he did violate his parole in 2021, which meant he wound up back in custody, but he should never have been released in the first place. Now, David Parker Ray, he never ever seen his sentence through because on May the 28th of 2002, before he was transferred to prison, he suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 62. I hope to God he rots in hell and I hope to God every single suspect that we've spoken about in this case, even the ones that we don't know exist, like police corruption and God knows what else, allegedly, I hope you all burn in hell. Or worse. If there is worse, I hope you get it. But my loves, that is the end of this case. I know it was a heavy one and I know it was really hard to listen to. It was hard for me to get through. But you know what? Despite this maybe seeming like an overdone case, I think this one is so important. As always, I want to do a complete 360, bring it right back round to the victims. And the women who have survived this and come forward, you are the epitome of strength and bravery. I hope these women understand just how inspirational they are and how incredible they are to survive something like this and come out the other end. And honestly, I hope and pray that I have even just 1% of your strength because it is absolutely incredible. And for the victims who 
lost their lives, whose family are missing their loved ones, I am sending so much love and prayer your way. And I know my audience, you guys, I know that you'll be doing the exact same for these families. If you did find this one interesting, please don't forget to subscribe. Put that notification bell on so you don't miss when I upload, which is twice a week, every single week, Wednesday and Sunday with a brand new interesting true crime case. Any case suggestions you have can be left down below or you can send them over on the Google Doc, which is the best way to contact me for case suggestions because my email is just not allowing all the emails through for some reason or they're going into spam and it's just it's causing me grief because I don't want to be ignoring anyone I love talking to you and getting back to you so the google doc's probably the best bet or you can always dm me over on instagram I do have a few dms that I'm working through just now and um, so please bear with I'll, I'll, I will get there I just want you to know that I love and appreciate and adore every single one of you and I don't say that lightly I don't say that for the sake of saying it genuinely feel so connected to you and I love chatting to you guys in the comments so please make sure you drop something below even if you just want to chat I'm always up for it certified japper but that's it for today please remember be a good person do not be a bad person stay safe look after each other and I will see you in the next one bye <laughs>